Well, we'll go ahead and get started then. Stunning crowd this evening. <laughs> Thank you for coming, those of you that are here. Uh, so what we're going to go over tonight is some of the standard build and development tools that are inherent in Linux. Um, so we figure most people that are using Linux are probably going to be using it to do some form of programming at some point. So it's kind of useful to know what it looks like as a programming environment. If you just want to use this Linux to surf the web, then a lot of this lecture is maybe not going to be super pertinent to you. But if you're ever planning on doing any kind of development in Linux, uh, then these are the kind of tools that you'll be touching. You also may just have to do it, even if you're not writing your own code every now and then you need to compile someone else's code. So uh, it's good stuff to know from that context. Um, so to kind of start out, I wish there was like a centered whiteboard because some of this would just be better to draw. But there's a series of tools. I mean, Linux is kind of always, and Unix in general, has always been built around a programming community to some extent. So there are a lot of programming tools built into Linux itself, and a lot of the things in Linux are really tailored toward uh, doing programming with them and being able to compile and build. This is a lot different from an operating system like Windows, where there's not even a compiler included by default. And I mean, if you want to compile a program on Windows, it involves installing a whole bunch of extra software. I mean, it's not what Windows was ever really designed for. But you would be hard pressed to find a Unix install that does not have a, a standard C compiler just installed on it by default, because that's such an inherent property of the system. People assume that you can compile code on the fly in Linux, because sometimes you need to to get things done. Um, so I guess standing back one step, for people who maybe aren't familiar with how compiling and the like works. There's actually a working one. So, all the G's to over drew the nice comics. So last week we did some very basic programming, but the kind of programming we were doing last week is called scripting, meaning that basically you write a bunch of commands into a file and then there's another program that just goes through the file line by line and runs each command. Uh, that's different from how most programs are written, and most programs aren't scripts, they're compiled programs. So when you have a script, you have something like we had last week where you just have a text file and that turns straight into runnable code. And there's a lot of magic involved in this arrow here when you're doing scripting. But from the user's perspective, this is what's going on. You open a text file, you write a bunch of bash script, as long as you include your fancy little shopping, whatever program needs to execute at the top, then it's just going to run it like a program. I need to make it executable, but essentially it's going to run it like a program. That differs from how most programs work. In that with most programs, you start with a text file. But then you have to send it through a number of steps. So first you have to do what's called compiling it. And then this generates what's essentially a type of assembly code. Then you end up, I mean, there's other various steps in here, but eventually you need to assemble this. And then you actually end up with runnable code, where this is machine code at this point. It's no longer a text file. It's not human readable. Uh, it's a whole bunch of X, well, on your computer's x86 byte code. Um, and what we're going to kind of talk about tonight is what you need to do to go through this process. So the disadvantage to this, I mean, the reason we do things like this instead of saying everything be scripts is scripts are actually fairly inefficient when it comes to needing to run something over and over again. And if like the Linux operating system itself was written as a script, then it begs the question of you need some other program with the script always running that can interpret the script for you. So like with bash scripting we did last week, you need a copy of bash running. So there's a chicken the egg problem. It's how do you get that first copy running that you can then use to run all your other scripts. Whereas when you're compiling, you can go down to code that your processor and your machine knows how to run natively. It doesn't need anything else to run it. So things like Linux are actually compiled down to code. Most of the programs in your machine are actually compiled down to code. Um, they're not scripts, they're runnable natively. This starts to blur the line between what's a script and what's a program has blurred some in the last 10 years with the rise of Java and stuff. But essentially, there are two different things we're doing here. So I'm going to talk about this process in some more detail. Have I lost people yet? OK. Cool. 
So what we have in Linux is then what's kind of called a tool chain, where your tool chain is just the collection of, so there is a program that performs this step for us called the compiler. There's a program that performs this step for us called an assembler. There's some other programs in here that kind of represent what these arrows are doing. Uh, and the tool chain is just what we call the collection of basically all the programs over here that uh, are what we actually need to get from point A to point B when we're trying to build a program or we're trying to compile a program from source code. Um, your tool chain can also include things that you use to work with these. So often your editor will be in here uh, if you're trying to you have things like debuggers in here, which we probably won't touch on tonight. Um, stuff like version control. So the tool chain in general just refers to the collection of all the programs you use when you're editing, maintaining, or building code on a computer. Um, and on Linux, you have a fairly standardized tool chain. Complements of the GNU project, which we talked about before. So GNU builds a lot of the software that we use in Linux, and the GNU tool chain is kind of the main standard tool chain that you'll use on Linux. And it involves, the main program it involves is called GCC which is the GNU C compiler, or in this case, C and C++ compiler. So GCC is actually a Swiss Army knife, and it actually is more than just a C compiler. There is also a Java compiler uh, and a few other. There's a few other. It can compile a few other languages, too. But when you do the man page for GCC, it brings up the C parts of the compiler. Um, so this is the program that will take things like C programs and turn them into runnable code for you. Now, this is actually a bit of a lie. GCC is actually a compiler, an assembler, and a few other things all rolled into one. So this is, we'll also do assembly and stuff like that for you, but we're not going to get too deep into that kind of stuff. Um, but we'll take a look here in a few minutes. Matt's going to take us through compiling a program, and when we compile the program, it's almost, actually it's a good question, is it in C? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're going to compile a program that's written in C, so GCC will be one of the things we call to do that. Um, other things we're going to deal with tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about make files. So often when you're compiling a program, I mean, in the simplest sense, and we'll maybe go over this in a little bit, but in the simplest sense, I just want to just do it. So if I can just write, like, the world's simplest C program, right? So don't worry, this is not a C class, so don't worry too much about not knowing exactly what's going on here. GCC will actually look with that. It's been writing Python code all this now. Okay, so we have, in this case, a very basic C program. I mean, this could be a wide variety of programming languages, but you often start out with some kind of source code. So this is the program, in this case, the source code is just one file. Uh, life's pretty easy. I can compile that one file by actually just calling GCC, and then the name of the file, and I can specify some other things, but if I don't specify anything else, it's going to run and it's going to spit out this a.out file, where this a.out file is actually my runnable program. It's green because my terminal is set to color code anything that's marked as executable as green, so we'll notice it has the x next to it, and that's why it's being marked as green. Um, but now if I go to run this, so I can run it essentially like we were running our scripts last week, but notice unlike a script, I have to run the output compiler, I can't just run hello.c directly. Hello.c is, the computer doesn't know what to do with that. Um, but if I run a.out, I get my nice little hello world here. It's actually an executable program, and it spits out the end code. Um, yes? So I, I was trying to make it in, uh, in Vim, and I just did it. I forgot to include the, uh, the suffix .c++ plus plus at, the, or .c uh -huh. at the end. How do you rename, like, quickly rename the file? So MV is also renamed in Linux. 
Uh, so it would be MV, the name of, so if I wanted to rename hello.c, so if I did the opposite of you and uh, did that, then it would take the suffix off. Okay. All right. so, or, so yeah, so there is no, right. All right. Yeah, so XL I've been to just do it outside of them. Um, GCC actually doesn't, I mean, like most things in Linux, GCC is pretty agnostic to what the ending is, although it probably would bark at me if I don't have a .c there, because yeah. I'd, I'd have to give it an extra flag to tell it that it's a .c file. But um, anyway, compiling one file like this is pretty straightforward. You can just call it GCC and it's very easy. But in real life, your programs are never one file, and especially if you're using someone else's code, you need to build a program from source, because maybe it's, there's no package for it, so there's no easy way to install it, you have to do it the hard way. Uh, a lot of the big useful programs in life are tens if not hundreds of files. And when you start to have that many files, it becomes really non-trivial to compile them with one command. Um, so we have these things called make files, and what make files are is they're basically recipes that tell the computer how to build your code. So the make file says call GCC on these files, and then it says do this with these files. And basically it's, you can think of it kind of like a type of script, it's, it's like a bash script with some extra rules. Um, it's a bash script that understands kind of this dependency concept. So you say, I need this file and here's how you, here's the commands you have to run to get it. And then I need this file and it needs these two files and make knows then to go look at those two files, run the commands to make them, and then run the commands to make the file that uses those two files. So we'll look at make in some more detail here, but uh, so GCC is kind of the core part of the tool chain. Make is another major part of the GCC tool chain. So it has a man page as well. Um, you'll notice all of these have the GNU in front of them because they're all built by the GNU organization or maintained by the GNU organization. So we're going to look a little bit at Make tonight. Um, other files that we'll, other programs we may deal with, there is, so <laughs> when you start to have big programs, you start to write what's called Make Files. Like I said, it tells you how to build the program. When you start to have really big programs, even writing a Make File by hand becomes too complicated. And then we have a program called Automate that makes make files that make your program. So computer scientists love just wrapping things in, in direction whenever they can get away with it. This is an example of that. Uh, so we have make files tell you how to make programs, and then we have other programs that tell you how to make make files. And when you get big enough, you start just kind of dealing in the very high level of even your make files are auto-generated. Um, so we're not really going to get into the details of doing that because it gets complicated, but what we're doing next is going to depend upon that. Uh, configure's not a program, it's just a script, generally, right? So lots of times packages come with a script called configure, and what configure does is it calls all the commands that's necessary to generate a make file dynamically for your program. Um, and part of the reason we do this when we download packages is many packages are written to run on a wide variety of computers. So they'll work on OS X, they'll work on Linux, They'll work on Unix, they'll work on your cell phone that has a completely different type of processor. And what configure does is it basically detects what your system looks like and then builds the make file that matches your specific, the specific commands you need to run on your system and then calls the make file to actually build the code for your system. So we start to get several levels away from actually ever calling GCC ourselves. But just kind of know, at the end of the day, it's all getting down to GCC with just some clever scripting and tools between us and GCC to build a lot of this stuff. Uh, there are programs, Automake, I don't know if I have it installed on here. Okay, so Automake is like Configure, so Configure does the same thing, but Automake is another one of these programs that builds make files for you based upon some higher level parameters. Uh, and often, you, you won't often need to touch this directly, but this is what's running behind the scenes when you download some big project source code and they say run the configure script. It might be making a bunch of calls to automate to actually build the make file. This is part of a wider set of tools called auto tools. I don't, I don't know if they have their own hand page. Yeah, no. auto oh, okay. Okay. So autoconf then generates these configure scripts that we're going to be running here in a little bit. So. Up at the top level, you have this auto star collection of tools that actually build a lot of the stuff that is more traditional that you would build yourself. Um, but the main takeaway here isn't so much you need to know how to use all these programs as you should know they exist and you should know that that's the magic happening behind the scenes. And if you ever find yourself managing a 100 person software project maintaining some ginormous program, then you will actually have to know how to use these. But just as a user, 
it's sufficient to basically know they exist and their magic is making your life easier. Questions on any of that? Okay. The things, so most people do still, in my day-to-day -day life, I still write all my make files by hand because for most individual projects, that's, I mean, you don't want to be compiling by hand, but writing make files by hand is perfectly fine. So we will actually spend some time looking at how to write a make file after we go through Matt's example here. Um, but we're not going to get into how to write auto make and stuff like that because it, it gets too abstracted to really be useful on a day-to-day -day project basis. Have you ever had to write like an auto comp thing? I don't know how. I've, I've had times where it might have been useful, but there's only so much you can actually teach yourself, right? So. Yeah, so in, in most people's, <laughs> if you're going to be spending time working on Linux servers and maybe doing a little bit of programming, knowing make will be useful. Knowing how to write some of this higher level stuff probably not so useful. So that's what we're going to go over tonight. Um, another thing we'll probably, if we have time, we'll touch on at the end. If not, maybe I'll include some links in my email, but uh, it's called what we call it version control systems, which essentially the crux is, again, this comes down to, if you just have a one program or a one file program, life's pretty good, right? I can just make copies of it if I want to change things, I want to keep the old version, so on and so forth. But when you start to get into programs that have hundreds of files, you want some ability to be able to kind of maintain a history of all of your changes, such that if you change something and everything breaks, you can roll back to an earlier state, you can see what's changed. This also gets in, if you're working with a group of people, you need some way to essentially keep code synced across a group of different people's computers, so on and so forth. There's an entire suite of what we call version control systems that solve this problem for us. Um, the hip and groovy one today is called Git, which is what we may touch on some in a little bit. You can read all about it by doing a man Git. Um, it's what's actually used to maintain the Linux kernel itself. So it is very much a heavy duty, but also very usable. It's, kind of a starling example of a really nicely done software piece of software. Um, but we'll maybe over get a little bit. It's really useful if you're in a situation where you have a bunch of files and you need to kind of track how they change over time and be able to return to previous snapshots of them to be able to see who changed what at what time, that kind of stuff. Um, this isn't, Git is not just useful for writing programs. It can also be useful if you have like large data sets that you're collecting. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful with what how big your data gets, but sometimes you can use Git in kind of non-conventional ways to keep track of changes to files in just a generalized manner. Like many things in Unix, Git does a good job of not assuming too much about what you're trying to do with it, and thus you can use it for a lot of things that maybe it was never intended to do in the first place. Questions on kind of any of this high level, what we mean when we talk about a tool chain, what these tools are. The other key component of any tool chain is your editor, but we've touched on that already. You know, you can of them, but if you know how to use an editor, you know how to use a compiler, you know how to use make, you know how to use a version control system, then you can pretty much walk into any kind of software development environment and at least not look like an idiot. Um, your ability to write code may still be in question, but you'll at least know how to use other people's code and build code and, and navigate that environment. All right.